English teacher friends, Christian Kuhn coming at you again, affectionately known as the Bob Ross of composition. And in fully knowing that getting kids to develop real good, close rhetorical analysis reading skills to be able to tear apart a rhetorical text, it takes yeoman's work and a little bit of ingenuity. So what we're going to do in this particular exercise is practice our rhetorical reads but I'm going to gamify it and show you yet again my Plato's Plato discussion. And in this particular version, we're going to take a look at a slew of texts, a slew of rhetorical texts. Most of them are letters, and we're going to play Connect Four. I'll walk you through the whole process in just a bit. But before I do, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's called Christian Kuhn, the Bob Ross of Composition. Please spread the word far and wide to friends, colleagues, and students. So let me tell you why I gamify discussions and how I came up with this Plato's Plato discussion. So very early in my career, probably in my practicums, I learned the merits of the fishbowl, the Socratic seminar, and the Harkness discussion. Those are like the holy trinity of our discussion modalities. And when I got to my district 21 years ago, I found that discussions often fell flat and I felt like a lousy teacher at the end, you know, during my reflection period. And here's why. Oftentimes there's a particular group and it's a small group of students that monopolize the conversation and a whole bunch of kids just blend in with the wallflowers and they don't participate. I have no idea if they're taking anything away. Uh, they seldom open their mouths and they look by and large generally disengaged. So I was doing some reading and I learned about gamification and edutainment. So what a Plato's Plato discussion does is takes the best elements, the functioning elements of the fishbowl, the Socratic seminar, and the Harkness discussion, and we gamify it. And I'm going to unpack that in just a sec and show you how we're going to gamify our practice reads. Here's my thinking. If students can ask juicy questions of a text, they are going to fully ascertain the complexity and meaning of the piece. And that's one of the kickers of a Plato's Plato discussion. Kids are asking the questions. And I like this because it gets me out of my wagon wheel mode. And here's what I mean by this analogy. Oftentimes in classroom discussions, teacher will ask a question. It goes out to the kid. And the kid responds and then teacher, you know, nods head or shakes head. Another question goes out and it's just a wagon wheel, right? Teacher at the center of the hub and you have all these spokes, which are the questions. I don't like that. It's not really a skillful discussion and pedagogically, I don't know if it's the most sound thing to do. And I like the gamified version because the students need to do the heavy lifting. Also, what we're doing in a gamified discussion, the Plato's Plato discussion, is we're going to combine the elements of collaboration and competition, which are crucial to classroom discussion. And then the big thing is this, in terms of fostering good readers, pattern, 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 pattern. I think the more text that students see, theoretically and technically, there's only so many things a writer can do. And they begin to see that the terms, the devices, the techniques keep recurring over and over and over again. That translates beautiful into their multiple choice test taking ability, right? Because they got to be able to see the patterns of those questions. And then the next step is, Good readers are good writers, and all of that combines together, right? And again, I'll say it again. Good readers dig deep, right? Good readers, good writers equal good readers. So all of this goes hand in hand, right? We're building upon many skills all in one fell swoop. So in terms of gamifying, you literally can use any game at your disposal. For this particular discussion, we're going to use Connect Four. But as you know, if you've seen my my you know videos in my channel, I use Tic Tac Toe. I have used Jenga. I've used Hungry Hippo. But let me explain what we're going to do in terms of the rules and guidelines for Connect Four. Here it is. I'm going to split the the class up into a yellow team and a red team. And each of the two teams will create a minimum of three text-based questions for each passage. And I've already alluded, I have a ton of passages in this activity. 
So per example, the yellow team will present the red team with one of their questions and the correct answer earns one chip. You either drop it or you don't. Wrong answers forfeits the turn. And then my role is I'm kind of the game show host and I beg and plead students to go deeper, get their nose in the text. Or if the if the answer is just blatantly wrong, I say, eh, you're wrong. And then I have the team unpack it for the other team so that our comprehension um, is all squared away. All right, enough talking into the ether. Let's play ball. I'm going to show you uh, exactly how we do this with a couple of texts and then the other text, you're kind of left to your own devices. You can figure it out. So I'll read this letter that Ben Franklin wrote to Arthur Lee, and then I'll show you the questions that my students came up with for it. So it says, sir, it is true I have omitted answering some of your letters. I do not like to answer angry letters. I hate disputes. I am old, cannot have long to live have much to do and no time for altercation. If I have often received and borne your magisterial snubbings and rebukes without reply, ascribe it to the right causes. My concern for the honor and success of our mission, which would be hurt by our quarreling, my love of peace, my respect for your good qualities, and my pity of your sick mind, which is forever tormenting itself with its jealousy, suspicions, and fancies that others mean you ill wrong or fail in respect for you. If you do not cure yourself of this temper, it will end in insanity, of which it is the symptomatic forerunner as I have seen in several instances. God preserve you from so terrible and evil and evil and for his sake pray suffer me to live in quiet i have the honor to be very respectfully sir your most humble servant so as teams the kids get together and they kind of unpack this text and like i said earlier they got to come up with a minimum of three questions to pose to the other team here's a flavor of some of the question here's number one syntactically Observe how the first three sentences are short declarative, short, simple declarative sentences. First, how does this construct Franklin's tone? Second, how does the rhetorical maneuver create meaning in the work as a whole? So one of the catchphrases that my students use a lot of is, how does it construct meaning as a whole or what's the author's intent? So you can see them borrowing my language here in this particular question. And I also, I should have said this earlier, the text are in uh, the description below. So you have access to all the text and the links for all these questions are also down there as well. Number two, and I spy with my little eye that the fourth sentence is a long run on. Again, syntactically, why is this significant? What is the effect and purpose? Skip to number three. There is a tone shift in the fourth sentence, identify the tone and the diction that triggers this shift. So lots of syntax questions, lots of diction tone questions, really juicy questions. Number four, the tone shifts again by the manner in which Franklin concludes the letter. Identify the tone and the authorial intent. Love these questions. Number five. What is Franklin's overall attitude toward Lee? Beautiful. So again, all the questions are down below. So these, si these slides that you're seeing here are right down below in the description as well as the text. I'll show you questions for one more that I have, and it's uh, the presidential memo, My Dog Ranger from President George H.W. Bush. And again, the text is in the description below. It's too big to throw onto slides. So here is question one. Rhetorically, why is it significant that this message is in the form of an official White House memo? Number two, the subject heading of the memo is in all caps. Great syntactical observation. How does this create meaning in the work as a whole? Number three, the memo features the frequent use of the short, simple declarative sentence. Why? I want to pause here and point something out to you. The uh, Ben Franklin letter to Arthur Lee 
actually ask the exact same question. So one of the things I want my students to do is start paying attention to sentence complexity and syntax at sentence level. I know the multiple choice questions often ask those types of questions. So again, if kids can pick it up on their own in their reading, they can anticipate the question in the multiple choice. Number four, open up your tone bank identify the tones at play. So I have a exhaustive list of tier two level words to help kids accurately ascertain tone. So they just go into their Google Classroom, open up that tone bank and either use words from the list or create synonyms around those specific words. So identifying tone is a little tricky for some kids. Number five, President Bush is quite literally asking his staff to take these measures. Given this, why does he take this rhetorical approach? What is the effect? And you can get into all the ethos, pathos, logos, the tone, the diction, the syntax via these questions. And then the sixth question is identify instances of, of hyperbole. Why is this device employed and how does it construct meaning in the work as a whole? Very cool. So let me tell you the other texts that are in here and their corresponding questions, as I've already said, are in the description below. We have a very cool letter that Henry Rollins wrote to some of the bands he was playing with and said, hey, get on stage on time. And that's rhetorically loaded. Another one that we have is a letter to Franz Kafka. So a fan wrote out, you wrote a letter to him and said, hey man, I don't get metamorphosis and I bought copies of this book for members of my family and they don't know what it means. And quite honestly, I don't know what it means. And to save face, because I have a doctorate degree, you gotta tell me what it means. And we all know that Kafka never disclosed the significance of metamorphosis. Another one is Ayn Rand's response to Can't Fancy. And again, this is located down below. Cat Fancy editor wrote to Ayn Rand and said, hey, you of all people, why are you subscribing to my magazine? And the next one is H.G. Wells to the mayor of Cambridge. And it's a very, very short piece and it's right there on that slide. Moving on, we got Carl Sagan's letter to Chuck Berry on his 60th birthday. And moving forward, I got a ton of stuff here. Bertha Brewster wrote a fantastic little ditty, and it's right there on that slide, and it's down below in the description. I have uh, something called Breakfast, a recipe by Zelda Fitzgerald. A great way to practice tone with these because I think kids have to develop their ears when they read. Uh, a letter that Jack London wrote. And then I have a Steven Spielberg letter that is down below. And getting towards the end here, this is a fantastic letter. It's a naval officer to a creditor. So the credit card company or the credit company is asking them to, you know, make good on late payments. And it's a very cunning piece. Uh, in response to the creditor. And the very last one is Hunter S. Thompson to Eleanor McGar. All right, happy teaching, happy writing, my friends, happy gamifying. If you have any questions, please reach out at teachingwritingcoach at gmail.com. Also know I'm very active in the ELA circuit. So I'm doing a lot of webinars for applied practice, perfection learning, uh, doing some work with National Writing Project, NCTE, College Board, and uh, you can stay abreast of my uh, comings and goings. I have a calendar at teachinghowtowrite.com. All of those webinars are for free. I do offer PD. I'm working one-on-one -on -one with teachers this summer in a really cool container. So if you want to work with me and, and learn about my heuristics and how to become a better writing instructor, how to gamify my alternative grading methods, hook me up with an email and we'll talk specifics on that. Students note that I have my own tutoring company. It's called Write at Ivy Write. Uh, I'm an Ivy League graduate, did all my graduate work at Ivy League schools and even worked admissions at Brown. So when you get to that college application process, I'm pretty expert in get, you know, helping kids crank really good personal statements and supplements. So once you reach that bridge, give me a holler and I can help you out. All right, that's it from here. Hope all is well and I'll keep them coming in the days, weeks, months, years to come.